Just a couple of announcements as we uh, gather on this Christmas Eve. Uh, it's really good to look at my Zoom screen and see everybody's faces and see everybody's uh, decorations. Especially good to see my daughters from Chapel Hill and Minneapolis who have uh, logged in this evening. So that means a lot to me. Since we couldn't be there, they can be here sort of virtually. Our service uh, this evening does include the Sacrament of the Lord's Supper. If you haven't already, take a moment to um, get your elements together, something to use for bread, something to use for the cup. And uh, as I say, the words of institution later on in the service, we will all partake at the same time. Our usual candle lighting uh, service will certainly be different this evening. I hope you have a candle ready so that at that part in the service, you can um, do that as well as we use our, um, do our candle lighting during the reading of the John passage. Grateful for Chris being here as well, providing music for this evening, for Tina who will sing for us and Macy Smith who will be offering a gift of dance later on in the service. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. The Advent liturgy helps us recollect the miracle of God's becoming human for our sake. The candles spiral upward, causing us to remember the eternity of God's love for us and for all humanity. This greenery causes us to remember the newness of life we have in Christ Jesus. The first candle reminds us of the prophet's hope for God's salvation to come. The second candle reminds us of the angel song of peace for all the earth. third candle reminds us of the joy of the shepherds as they heard the good news of Jesus' arrival. The fourth candle reminds us of the love poured out for the world on that night so long ago. We have heard, seen his glory the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Come, let us go and see this that has happened.
with me, if you would, in our litany for Christmas Eve. Like pilgrim shepherds, we have gathered tonight. Like children of royalty, we have come together to celebrate the birth of true royalty. Our Savior comes to us as a babe, wrapped in swaddling clothes. He lays aside his crown to dwell among us and share the joy and sorrow of our pilgrimage. He passes through the curtain around God's love and holding it aside invites us in. Oh, the humanity of God, the divinity of God's children. What child is this? What love is this that seeks to share our burdens and lead us on in kindness towards a glory that is gentle and peaceful like a meadow in spring? O oh God, roll away the stone in our hearts and let our spirits soar into that realm where angels laugh, martyrs weep for joy, and God's infinite love dances among the singing throngs of those who have gone before us. That we may know what has been accomplished in that, this child, that we may see the world as you see it, Lord, sanctified, cleansed, and sojourning towards a healing so great, we are almost afraid to hope in it. On the night before his death, Jesus said to his disciples, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now the risen Christ in perfect joy graciously invites us to join him at the table, to break and share the bread of life and lift with him the cup of salvation. O Lord, as we join you at your table on this sacred eve, accept us as we are, even in all our imperfections. Jesus says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest upon your souls. What shall we render to the Lord for all God's bounty to us? We shall lift the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. This Christmas tide, let us, our spirits so entwine that we form a wreath of joy a circle of light from which God's precious and fragile love will shine out into the darkness of this world and into our own hearts. It is in the strong name of Jesus who came to us as a child that we ask this, amen. And let us confess our sins together. This is the night we are reminded that God loves to be with us. Yet all too often by our choices, our words, our silence, we choose not to be with God. Join me as we pray on this holy night to the one who was born to gift us with mercy and hope. This was going to be the year when we were going to give away more than we spent, but we didn't. This was going to be the season when we spent more time with others, but we filled our calendars with meetings. This was going to be the Christmas when we wrote personal letters to friends and family, but spent too much energy filling out our to-do list. This was going to be a truly holy season, but it just got too hairy and hurried. Forgive us and draw us closer to the baby born, not into wealth and power, but into poverty and weakness, to the one who loves unconditionally and welcomes all, to the child who gathers other children to him to bless them and serve them, to the one who drew near to us so we might be drawn to your heart, Jesus Christ, our brother, our Lord. God, remember your baptism and be great. Loving God, into the valleys of our death, Jesus comes with life. Into the shadows of our world, Jesus brings light. Into the brokenness of our lives, Jesus brings forgiveness and peace. Thanks be to God for the gift of the baby of Bethlehem who brings joy and peace to us in these moments of forgiveness and in all the days to come. Amen.
Let us pray. Loving God, by the gift of your spirit, teach us like Mary to treasure your words and ponder them in our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, your word made flesh. Amen. Our first passage of scripture to be read this evening comes from the prophet Isaiah reading in the ninth chapter, verses two through seven. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, who lived the land of deep darkness. On them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder rejoice. As on the day of Midian, you shattered the yoke that burdened them, the staff of their shoulders and the rod of their oppressor. Because every boot of the thundering warriors and every garment rolled in blood will be burned to fuel for the fire. A child is born to us, a son given to us, and authority will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There will be vast authority and endless peace for David's throne and for his kingdom, establishing and sustaining it with justice and righteousness now and forever. The zeal of the Lord of heavenly hosts will do this.
Thank you, Macy. Our second passage of scripture is familiar story of the birth of Christ taken from the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter, verses 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver the child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord went around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is Holy Scripture for God's people. Thanks be to God.
There is a Presbyterian minister, Reverend Michael Linval, who is also an accomplished writer, having written several well-known books, including the two companion novels, Good News from North Haven and Leaving North Haven. Although strictly seen as novels, these two books are really made up of short stories in the Lake Webagon Prairie Home Companion genre about the experiences of a mythical Presbyterian preacher in the mythical small town of North Haven, Minnesota. What better time to tell a story than on Christmas Eve? And so I share with you the story of the Christmas pageant. The Christmas pageant is over. It was in the end wonderful. And now that it has passed my blood pressure and in fact, the church's communal blood pressure have dropped about 20 points. We got through it again without schism and no divorces. None of the kids got grounded this year, but it was close. The whole saga of the Christmas pageant really began precisely 47 Christmases ago when Alvina Johnson first directed Second Presbyterian's Children's Christmas Pageant, something that she continued to do through 10 pastors, nine US presidents, three wars, and who knows how many Christian education committees for the next 46 years, but not this year, and that's the story. International alliances came and went, wars were fought and peace made, ministers were called and then called away, but Alvina Johnson directing the children's Christmas pageant was like a, was like a great rock in a turbulent sea. Alvina is Mrs. Johnson, although there is no Mr. Johnson, there was a Mr. Johnson for only three and a half weeks, 49 years ago. A few days shy of their month's wedding anniversary, Mr. Johnson, nobody remembers his first name, left. Although Alvina never puts it that way, she prefers to say he just ran off to Minneapolis with the accent on Minneapolis, as if that were a notorious place. And, Mr. Johnson's morally feeble nature that lured him away from wife and home rather than having anything to do with Alvina. Nobody here ever talks about why he left. They all know, just as they know why rain falls down and grass grows up. One might call Alvina stubborn, but that word isn't quite enough. Alvina is intractable, intransigent, unmovable. 
This everybody assumes Mr. Johnson easily discovered in the space of three and a half weeks. When folks around here get put out with Alvina, who is disguised as a sweet and demure 70 year old lady, they refer to her under their breath, of course, as the iron butterfly. But Alvina does what she says always exactly and forever. 47 years ago, somebody asked her to do the Christmas pageant. She said, yes. They didn't say, would you do the Christmas pageant this year? So Alvina, who is a literalist in all things, assumed that they meant forever, and she is a one of her word. Alvina's pageants always had precisely nine characters, one Mary, one Joseph, three wise men, two shepherds, one angel, and one narrator. The script was simply the Christmas story out of the King James Bible, which meant that two six-year-old shepherds had to learn to say, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Auditions for the nine parts were held the last Sunday afternoon in October for 46 years. Rehearsals for the nine lucky winners were held for the next five Sunday afternoons. Alvina's goal was nothing less than perfection in Christmas pageantry, perfect lines, perfect pacing, blocking, enunciation, perfect everything, which is not easily achieved with little children, even nine carefully selected ones. Critics said that Alvina would have much preferred working with nine midget actors if she could have gotten away with it. Time and again, people tried to get Alvina to open things up so that every kid who wanted a part could have one. Alvina, they would say. Scripture says there, there was a heavenly host, not just one lonely angel. Alvina, why not a few more shepherds? Then everybody could be in the pageant. Or Alvina, if there were shepherds, there had to be sheep, right? We'll make some cute little woolly sheep outfit for the three, four, and five-year-olds. Nope, she'd answer. Too many youngsters, too many problems. Early in the fall, however, something happened that deflected the inertia of nearly half a century of always doing it the way it had always been done. The Christian Education Committee included the three young mothers of last year's rejected Mary, Joseph, and wise man number two. And these young mothers pulled off what they call in Central America a coup d'etat. At their September meeting, they passed the following motion. Resolved, all children who wish to be in the Christmas pageant may do so. Parts will be found. Alvina heard about it that night and was in my office the next morning at nine o'clock sharp. She began by asking me if I thought the decorations on the Christmas tree in the church parlor were appropriate. I had not noticed them, I said. Well, she informed me, they were walnut shells decorated to look like little mice with tiny stocking caps on their heads. What, she asked, do mice have to do with the birth of our Lord? Now I knew this wasn't the problem. I too had heard about the committee meeting the night before. What's the matter, Alvina? I asked. Young mothers, she said. She spit these two words out as though young mother were an illicit occupation. Young mothers, she continued, who have no knowledge of or experience in the proper direction of a Christmas pageant. Young mothers are behind those walnut shell mice and they're behind the destruction of the Christmas pageant. She then resigned as director and said, if these young mothers know so much, let them try to do it. She was angry, maybe even angry enough to quit the church and become a Methodist, but she didn't. I suspect that she wanted to hang around at least long enough to see the young mothers fall flat on their faces. The pageant was last week. The young mothers didn't fall flat on their faces, but the pageant was, well, different than what everybody had come to expect over the last 46 years. It seemed as though there were a cast of thousands, even though the actual number was 50 or so, which was every kid in the church up to about eighth grade at this age. They would sooner die than get dressed up in their father's bathroom and pretend to be a biblical character. There must have been a dozen shepherds and 10 angels of the veritable heavenly host. Then there were the sheep, a couple dozen, three, four, or five year olds who had on woolly fake sheepskin vests with woolly hoods and their dad's black socks pulled on the, up on their arms and legs. The pageant was a lot of things, but smooth it wasn't. 
And one of the chief problems was those very sheep. Now, in suburban Christmas pageants, I imagine sheep are well-behaved and, and fairly quiet, but suburban kids have seldom seen real sheep. The only sheep most suburban kids have ever seen are on the front of Sunday church bulletin covers, peaceful grazing sheep who just stand there and look cute and cuddly. Half the kids here live on farms. They've seen real sheep, many of them. They know that sheep don't just stand there. They know that sheep don't often follow directions. They know that sheep are dumb. They know that all sheep want to do is eat. So when the young mothers casually instructed the two dozen sheep to act like sheep, they really should have known better. Some of the sheep started to do a, a remarkable imitation of grazing behind the community table. Some wandered over by the choir to graze and others went down the center aisle. Some of them had donuts they found in the church parlor to make their grazing look more realistic. When one of the shepherds tried to herd them a bit with his shepherd's crook, some of the sheep spooked and started to scatter just like real sheep do. Everybody knows that's how sheep act. It was in fact a remarkable imitation of sheep behavior even though a bit out of the ordinary for a Christmas pageant. Now, Alvina was watching all this from the last pew of the sanctuary. I could just see her from where I was sitting. As the sheep spooked and, and scattered with much imitation bleating, Alvina looked down to hide a smirk. Young mothers, I'm sure she was thinking. If they know so much, let them try to direct Christmas pageant. The real climax of imprecision came, however, at that point of high drama when Mary and Joseph enter, Mary clutching a, a baby doll in a blue blanket. This year's Mary, whose name was actually Mary, was taking her role with an intense and pious seriousness. She looked into the face of the doll in her arms with eyes that really seemed to see the infant Christ. Joseph was another story. He had gotten the part because he had been rejected from Christmas pageant participation by Alvina Johnson more times than any other kid in the church, with good reason, some might say. Anyway, Mary and Joseph were to walk on as the narrator read, and Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. At least that's what the narrator was supposed to say. It was what the narrator had read at the rehearsal. But a few hours before the performance, one of the young mothers had observed that none of the children could much understand King James English. So they voted in their ongoing mood of revolutionary fervor to switch to the good news translation of the Bible for the performance. What kid knows what great with child means, they asked. The Good News translation is much more direct at this point. So as Mary and Joseph entered, the narrator read, Joseph went to register with Mary who was promised in marriage to him. She was pregnant. As the last word echoed from the narrator through the PA system into the full church, our little Joseph hearing it froze in his tracks, gave Mary an incredulous look and peered out in the congregation and said, pregnant? What do you mean pregnant? This, of course, brought down the house. My wife, wiping tears from her eyes, leaned over to me and said, you know, that may well be just what Joseph actually said. Alvina was wearing a look that simply broadcast, I told you so. But as the pageant wound into its closing tableau and the church lights were dim for the singing of Silent Night, a couple of magical I would allow miraculous things happen. The sheep, when they had finished with their part, bleated their way down the aisle to sit in the last couple of pews to watch the end of the pageant. Alvina was in the last pew and she suddenly found herself surrounded by a little herd of three, four and five year olds in sheep outfits. It was late, the church was warm and the sheep were drowsy. I glanced over to Alvina as the Wise men were exiting and the organ was softly playing the melody of Silent Night. The sheep in the pew on either side of Alvina had fallen asleep and were 
resting their fake wool heads on her shoulders, something they would feel comfortable doing with any grown up in the church. As the church went dark for the singing of Silent Night, we could see what had been happening outside for the last hour. The first real snow of the winter was falling. Big, fat flakes floated down and covered everything with a white, uniform perfection. As we little kids and grown ups saw it, there was a spontaneous and corporate ah. We sang Silent Night, Holy Night, all is calm, all is bright. It was very softly that we sang and all the sheep were quiet, even the ones who were awake and everybody looked at the snow. It was, it was as if flakes of grace were falling, falling free out of heaven and blessing the land, the blessing the muddy earth with purity, a whiteness covering the dirt and the shoddiness with perfection. When the carol was finished, no one stirred for a long time. It wasn't planned, but we all just sat there and watched. It seemed like an eternity, but it was maybe two minutes. Minnie McDowell broke the spell. She's hard of hearing and always talks too loud. She meant to whisper to her husband, but everybody heard. Perfect, she said. Just, just perfect. And so it was. Not perfect in the way Alvina's pageants tried to make things perfect, but perfect in the way God makes things perfect. God accepts our fumbling attempts at performance, at love and fairness, and then covers them with grace. I think the moment may have even touched the iron butterfly. Many said that Alvina mentioned to her that they needed any more sheep cut outfits for the next year, she could perhaps find time to make a few. As we prepare to come to the table, our hymn of preparation is away in a manger. God's banquet is coming, the time we await when all will gather from north, east, west, and south. A banquet where the rich and powerful will sit with the weak and poverty stricken. A table where young and old will learn from each other. A time when all will sit together in peace and the wolf will lie down with the lamb. Here at this table, we get a foretaste of God's banquet this is indeed God's table, not the church's. And so all who seek to follow the way are welcome to eat and drink from it. Come and taste the grace eternal. Come and see that God is good.
May the God of silent nights be with you. Open your hearts to the one born in the little town of Bethlehem. May Emmanuel come to abide in our hearts. Join all believers in singing of our joy this night. May our voices blend with those of the angels and shepherds. You crept into chaos so long ago, so creation might be born. Sheep gathering on hillsides, stars glittering in the night skies. Silently you gathered up the dust, shaping us in your image as the spirit breathed life into us. All the gifts of your heart were for us, but we slammed the door of our hearts, saying there was no room for you in our lives. Prophets came time and again, scattering your clues throughout the story. But we were too busy enjoying the slights of hand done by sin and death. When you saw we could not understand the mystery on our own, you sent Jesus to reveal everything to us. As we gather with children dressed in bathrobes, as we join with the voices around us, we sing praises to you this Christmas night. We will not be afraid, for great joy is ours this night. We will look for the signs of your presence, grace swaddled in hope, love wrapped around broken hearts. Glory to you, God in the highest heavens. May peace fill the lives of all your children. Leaving your side, God of holiness, your child came to walk with us through the cold streets of our lives. Born in poverty shadows, he is the light which illumines your heart for us. Unwrapped from glory's embrace, he gathers us from all the corners of our confused choices to make us one with you. Placed in a rude feeding trough, layered with our fears and doubts, he breathes in your hopes and lives for your will until he is placed in death's cold embrace, waiting in the silence where he breathes in resurrection's breath and brings forth life for all to follow, who follow. On this night, when we sing of the baby in the manger, as the shadow of the cross is cast by the stars, we proclaim that mystery called incarnation. Christ is our light, and we will join the angels in singing the good news. Christ is our light, and we will join the disciples in telling the story. Christ is our promise, and we wait for the joy of his return. Here in the silence and the singing, with children in carols and candlelight, we gather around the table of joy as you pour out your spirit upon the most precious gifts of bread and cup. As we feast upon the bread, we remember a young pregnant girl and would serve those who are expecting, those who cannot have a child, those who have lost children. As we drink from the cup, we think of a worried father and would be with those who assemble toys this night, as well as those who will work this night to pay for food and medicine for their families. As we are surrounded by family and friends, we would care for those whose closest companion is loneliness, those separated from loved ones, those who hear no music, joy, or hope in their lives. And when all time and history becomes silence, we will be gathered with our sisters and brothers from across the world, from every corner and moment of every universe, to join the angel choirs in forever singing your praises as we dance to the table of wonder and grace and pray as Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on the night that he was arrested, our Lord, with his friends, his disciples, took bread from the table. He blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Friends, the bread of life. same manner after supper he took the cup pouring it out saying this cup is a new covenant poured out in my blood for you for the forgiveness of sins for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim my name until I come again the cup of salvation
Let us pray together the prayer after communion. Lord Jesus Christ, you put your life into our hands. Now we put our lives into yours. Take us, renew, and remake us. What we have been is past. What we shall be through you still awaits us. Lead us on. Take us with you. Amen. Why do we now light the Christ candle? The Christ candle reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. Come into our darkness to enlighten us and give us the light of God, which we share with others. As he says in John's gospel, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Friends, if you're on Zoom, I would invite you to go to gallery mode, gallery view, so that we can, everyone can see each other's candles as we light our candles. And I read the passage from the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life and the life was the light for all people the light shines in the darkness and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light the true light that shines on all people was coming into the world the light was in the world and the world came into being through the light the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people didn't welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believed in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The Word became flesh and made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth.
people of God, go now into this dark world carrying the light of life with you, carrying the light of God with you, carrying the love of Christ, the newborn King, with you. And as you go, keep the faith, live in hope, and love one another. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. And our closing hymn is Joy to the World. Christmas, everybody. Hope everybody has a wonderful, safe uh, Christmas and New Year's. We'll see you in church soon, I hope. Mm -hmm.